Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Spore the Warning podcast. This is review number 605 with a review of The Painter and the Thief. I'm Christopher Schneezy. And I'm Stephen Miller. And if you're joining us for the first time, the Spore the Warning podcast is a weekly film review program. Each week in the show, we're going to dive in, debate, discuss, and argue over the latest film releases coming to a theater near you. Um, this week, um, we're talking about a documentary. Um, you know, documentaries aren't things that we necessarily do too many reviews of here on the podcast, but... Uh, you know, of the things that were coming out, it seemed like it could be interesting, and we thought we'd dive in. You've definitely put some documentaries on your best of lists over the years. Yeah, I I have. In recent years, I've tried not to, just because it, it anything I can do to narrow the list makes it easier to make a top ten. <laughs> but yeah, in, in general, I see I see documentaries as being the thing is not every type of genre documentary is equal to a fictional film but there's a certain subset of documentaries that hit me in the same way that a drama does that i feel like i can equate them correctly like i rarely put a documentary that's like a i don't know a netflix style talking head doc in my in my top 10 list but things that are like experiential that somehow bowl you over with some kind of visual or emotional idea those can definitely reel me in the same way yeah, I mean, there are definitely some documentaries that I've seen that have totally stuck with me over the years. Um, but it's interesting because there are, there are like different types of documentaries. There are the type of documentaries where we all know about this thing that happened and the documentary is just trying to do a deep dive on what happened. There are other documentaries where some, someone has a subject matter that they want to do, like with the I- Icarus documentary. And then over the course of making the documentary, they... Um, they sort of discover something else and decide to go into that and tell a different story than they started out. So my question for you, Stephen, is what do you think the filmmakers intended to make this documentary about? Because this film opens with her painting, the painting that is stolen, which means from the outset, the filmmaker couldn't have known (laughs) that these paintings would be stolen, right? My belief is that the time-lapse painting scenes are not taken by the documentary filmmaker, that those are just cameras that the artist Barbara maybe put up in her studio. My guess was the documentary was set in motion immediately after the this the paintings theft were stolen. took place. That, gotcha. that was my guess, but I haven't looked up anything at all about it, so I don't really know. Yeah, because I mean, those, those, those time-lapse shots are incredibly cinematic i mean more mm-hmm. cinematic than some of the interviewee kind of scenes in this film um yeah so it definitely feels like you are getting that whole presentation from that moment but yeah maybe she did set those cameras up herself or maybe she did a full recreation of the painting that was stolen um that would which... be crazy that would be <laughs> that would be tim's vermeer that would be another another documentary they could make <laughs> did you did we review that one together is that why we i de- saw that I know we've definitely talked about Tim Vermeer on this podcast 100%. I don't, at this moment in time, remember if it was a full episode or if it was like mm-hmm. part of a, uh, like an omnibus or something that we did or just yeah. randomly we, we talked about it before something. Um, but, but yeah, Tim Vermeer was an awesome documentary. <laughs> yeah, I, I immediately thought of that when this documentary started. Just I was like, ooh, painting. It, it kind of reminded <laughs> me of why the subject matter could be a joy to watch. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, well, we, in a few, just a few moments, are going to figure out if this film was a joy to watch. Um, but before we get to that part, we are going to take a listen to the trailer, and then we're going to come back and let you know what we thought. When I close the door, I start to paint. That's my universe. Two paintings were stolen from a gallery in Norway today. The paintings were stolen in broad daylight. I don't know what to think. We have identified the thief. We have not found the painting. Uh, we had his name from the court papers. Hello? You might know who I am. I'm just a curious person. What made you do it? It was your masterpiece. Is that an anchor? Love to make I'll ask you regularly to sit here. I can tell you some more about how I got to be a criminal. This guy is often quite self-destructive. It feels like that is his way to be seen. You can open your eyes now. Whoa! What the f- 
There was no way how I could see the thief in this guy. You ser mer jävligt gott. Men hör glömma av till att jag ser henne minst lika gott. I might never find out where the paintings are. Do you know anything about black market with art? I have told you everything I remember, and that's the truth. For your open, like some here. You're the craziest person I've ever met. Let's see what you're doing for me. You inspire me. This is insane. This is a very, very sneaky guy. He's a bad boy. Really bad boy. I started to search for their paintings. You must know where it is. Do you understand the risk? Don't even try. Just tell me. Don't even try. I'm serious. This is destructive. All right, so that was the trailer for The Painter and the Thief. It is basically the story about a woman who um, she has a big exhibit coming up showing off a bunch of her art, and she has two large, like, I don't know, what are they, six by ten foot canvas paintings that she's done, and they are stolen in broad daylight, and this documentary sort of follows her as she begins to interact with the person who uh, took these paintings and sort of is just a look at that conversations between them and a look at the lives that they both lead over the course of however long this documentary takes place. Um, I honestly don't know, but I feel like there are portions of time that jump a long time, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't tell, but it feels like quite a while. Okay. So Stephen Miller, what did you think of The Painter and the Thief? Ah, oh, Christopher. Um <laughs> I really, really wanted to like this movie a lot more than I liked this movie. Um, (laughs) I'm wondering if this is like a casualty of the whole quarantine viewing at home format, because a part of me feels like in a movie theater or on an airplane, I might have felt more tenderness toward this movie. But sitting on my couch on a Sunday afternoon, it just felt like an eternity to me like the the setting is fitting because this movie as slow as shit <laughs> um, i was proud of that yeah um, that's pretty good and, and the thing is it, it isn't like i am some luddite who can't handle a slow naturalistic rhythm movie like literally the day before this joanne and i watched all three of the before movies back to back like we watched the whole trilogy um, yeah i'm perfectly happy with movies where people are just talking where it moves to its own rhythm, where it is about emotion. But there was something about this documentary that it just didn't add up to what it wanted to add up to for me. I mean, I'm not crazy. Like, I understand what the documentary is doing. It's trying to show multiple sides of the same picture, pull a kind of Rashomon of, like, we will reveal an event and we'll reveal characters through each other's eyes and through their own eyes. And we'll see how those two images combine to tell a full portrait of a person. Like, I love that idea. It it is a great idea for a documentary. I think the situation they found themselves in is very interesting. Like it could easily be a short story or like an act of fiction, right? It's that kind of thing that just feels ripe for investigation. Like, Or or it could be a feature length film that's not two hours long. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Like it could be the the artist who created something and has it stolen and then the person like what drives them to take it? What can they do to fill that void? How can they become the art that they've taken away? Like there's so many things that just it it makes total sense why this movie should work. And I think my problem is I feel like the movie is so aware of its clever concept it loses the sense of authenticity for me, even though I'm sure it is a true story. But it it feels like it's trying really hard to pull this grand cubist thing of like multiple perspectives baked in at once. I uh, I like the artist Barbara Kisilkova, I'm just gonna assume I got that name right. Um <laughs> she felt I believed her, but everything she did felt like she was very aware of the fact that she is in a documentary whose story is now going to be bigger than the painting she's trying to get back. Um, She felt like Adam Driver's character in While We're Young to me, where she's 
influencing or f making the art happening rather than just naturally observing it. And I just got the sense with the the way she seeks out Carl Bertel, the way she makes this friendship happen and the things she does as gestures of the friendship, they might be completely authentic. They might be true to her, but it it just felt like the movie was trying a little too hard. Like it was trying to tell this beautiful story. And for some reason that just didn't, didn't rub me the right way. It took me out of the movie, which is a shame because I think there's a ton to recommend about this movie. Like it has the wish fulfillment angle. It feels like an episode of heavyweight, right? Like getting to look at a thing that happened in the past and yeah. interrogate why did it happen? Um, it has obviously a very realistic depiction of heroin addiction and what that does to a person in a way that I found quite moving at times. Like it, you are really watching a person self-destruct and try to hide who they are on a camera. And that is a, a really powerful idea. And it does have some really lovely scenes. Like we referenced off mic, uh, the scene where Bartle sees his painting for the first time. And yeah. in the trailer that feels kind of forced or hokey, but in real life, like I bought it a hundred percent in the context of the movie. It, it was a really moving look at what any gesture of kindness would mean to a person in his position at that time, let alone, art being created to make you feel bigger than you are um but yeah i don't know it just all of that still didn't make it add up to that much for me i honestly think the relationship between barbara and her boyfriend is maybe more interesting than the one that is at the center of this film and i yeah. feel like maybe a series of couples therapy shots would be a better movie <laughs> than the one that there, we got there um, there is definitely a whole other film that has to be on footage somewhere. That is the boyfriend's response to this relationship that she's forming. Yeah. May, I mean, I maybe maybe everyone in Norway is extremely comfortable with their significant other spending uh, ungodly amounts of time with complete strangers one on one in isolation. Um, but mm. I but I feel that like there. <laughs> Like there, there's a point where he, where the boyfriend begins to voice his opinion, and then it turns out it's not about how close she's getting to this man. It's about her idealization of the tragedy that is part of his life and, right. and stuff that he's going through. And he's like, "Do you think it's ethical to really make this the subject matter of the painting that you're working on? Um, because it's just tragedy, and this is sort of like tragedy porn." I mean, he says it much more eloquently than I just did, but yeah. I, I looked him up, and he is a—he's a novelist, which explains okay. why he's so like philosophic about the way that he says things. Oh yeah, I, I for sure. When I when I was explaining to my girlfriend about this movie, and I was like, and then her boyfriend—I don't know what he does, but he feels like a philosophy professor at like yeah. a college who is like has tenure like fifteen times over, and goes to parties and tries to talk to drunk undergrads about his theories of mankind and stuff like that. <laughs> But, but yeah, I, I, I have more to say, but I'll lob it over to you. I think that's a good good enough segue. Yeah, so I mean, I I did not, I, I literally did not watch the trailer for this until we were texting back and forth trying to decide what we were going to watch this weekend. And I was like, oh, this yeah. seems pretty interesting. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I, I'm, I'm curious where this is going to go. And it seems like it could be pretty good. Um, I There are parts of this film that I did quite enjoy. Like, I think that, that these are this is this this film is the story you tell over beers about this interesting person you met one summer right this is mm. this is things that this the relationship they form is quite interesting but it's interesting because of who they are apart from each other and they're just being smashed together and we're getting the tale of who they are um apart while they're together and i think that's interesting um, the sort of conceit that you talked about of seeing the same thing back and forth. I I can't off the top of my head remember ever seeing this in a documentary where you watch a scene play out and then you change to a different chapter and you rewatch the previous scene and like the camera's in a different position and you're seeing yeah. that scene. Like a million relationship movies that we've seen, right? Like even like 500 Days of Summer, right? You see flashbacks to what the other person was hearing during a conversation that took place. And that is a really interesting thing that plenty of people do in narrative films. I've never seen it in a documentary. And like when that started happening, I was like, this is fucking brilliant. <laughs> like, yeah. 
I, I really like whatever this is. I, I don't think I've seen this before. And I kind of like peeked up and I was like, all right, give me more. And it never does it again after that scene. It's bouncing back and forth between the characters, but it's like they had enough footage to make this one really, really neat thing happen early on. And then they jettison that whole sort of presentation of the information. And I think that there is so much more happening that I want to know about. Like, like this is the type of documentary, and, it, and, and I don't mean it, it, this isn't a true crime podcast, or this isn't a true, true crime documentary, right? This isn't a thing where like, oh no, I need to find out who the killer is or anything like that. This is just a story where there was so much around the periphery of these individuals, questions that I want to know how, like why they're doing X or why this is going on. And the film either just didn't have access to that information or wasn't interested in telling that story. And instead it wanted to be this, like just this, this woman who finds a muse in this very troubled man um, who uh, doesn't have a shit together. And I think that there, there are enough, there are enough events that happen in the story to keep me wondering what's going to happen next. But then at some point the filmmaker goes like, okay, we have to end this film. And some like literally a character goes like oh remember when we were talking eight years ago what i didn't tell you was this and then it's like all of a sudden now that the movie's over and we get a few last shots of stuff that's happening yeah. which feels entirely disconnected from the story um and and the character like the journey that the thief has gone on before this point puts him in a place where the information she is sharing with him there's no way he cares about it, right? Like he cares about it in the way that like, oh, that's kind of funny. Um, the same way you might be like, look, I found a letter from high school that you sent me. How cool is this? Nobody listening can see me holding up a pretend letter to the webcam for Steven. Um, but, but I think that this film might be incredibly personal for everybody involved, but it's still, there's some sort of distance from the audience and we're not able to completely join in because we don't, we're not able to share enough with these these people. And I think that there are like like one of the things that I complain about in narratives films is when characters allude to things that we're not actually seeing being presented to us. Um uh like the joking one that I always bring up is in the adaptation of uh Little Women when uh Chalamet's character says like I quit billiards for you but we've never seen him play billiards right and it's like okay did you quit billiards I don't know that um in this film you know the thief writes her a letter and says like oh you know I'm I I really appreciate that like you'll buy me food when you don't even have enough money to feed yourself and and, and like outside of one scene where she's opening up a bunch of bills we have no context for whether or not she is a quote starving artist, right? Like, like all we know is that she can go to pubs and cafes whenever she wants to interview this guy and has unlimited canvases and drawing papers and, and stuff. But then yeah. this character makes the statement and then we get one scene where she's looking at bills. But as you said, like her husband clearly has money <laughs> because at one point she says like, Oh, I you know, I'm behind 15,000 on this one thing and then we never mention it again. So clearly it wasn't a huge issue for them. Um so yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff in this documentary that just left me kind of confused and perplexed and in the end the way it wraps up while the visuals of the last shot are very very I mean they're also problematic in a different way, but <laughs> um they're they're like it's an interesting shot that doesn't feel earned because of the journey we got to get to that point. Yeah. No, I, I think I agree. Um, I did find the, the ending is definitely shoehorned in, in a way that didn't give me the joy of discovery that I think the movie wanted it to have. And for all I know was an earnest joy of discovery, right? I have no reason yeah. to think they really tipped the scales. It, it's just the way that it plays. I do think though, there is a little bit of symbolism at the end that is basically mirroring a detail about an expert removal of nails that I, that I thought was a nice touch 
but then at the same time felt like this is such a nice touch. I feel like the documentary filmmaker told you to do this. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't know. I, I, I got that tug of war between am I watching something authentic or am I watching a thing that is being crafted? And normally I don't care, right? Normally the truth doesn't care, but this movie it feels like the value of it really hinges on the truth of what it means to the characters involved. And whenever I can't access them, then I kind of lose my, my will to follow this movie to the end. Um, like I think Carl Berto is an interesting character because he's like, he's clearly bullshitting a lot of the time. And he's also incredibly earnest at the same time. He's, a, yeah. he's the guy who is like, he's the classic drug addict, right? he, he has feelings. He isn't being malicious. He's not trying to manipulate you. But at the same time, he can just like be in his own world and say a thing to you that is completely implausible, right? Like you, you just have no recollection of this whole thing taking place. Really, you, you have no idea what happened. Yeah. Okay, I'll believe you, but do I believe you? Like a lot of his interactions feel they are a guy that is covering his tracks while trying to seem completely open and earnest. And maybe he is being open. It's just the layers are hiding something where I feel like I can't access him. And I think that is a very, very interesting character if you can peel back those layers. And I just don't feel like the movie does. I feel like the movie is so concerned with Barbara's relationship to him and what he means for her that it isn't, it isn't really letting us see inside the heart of the character in the way that all of the like the way the movie flows is as if we were learning more and more about these people but i i don't think we really do learn more about them we just learn about this story they're crafting together about how they healed from this event but it, it feels crafted to me and for some reason i just can't can't shake that feeling um i do have a hot take though which this is me channeling my inner carson uh, <laughs> this made me really appreciate the goldfinch <laughs> which is a uh a fictional movie much maligned last year uh, that involves both heavy drug addiction and the theft of art <laughs> and, and what that does to people. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to go check that out if you want a fictional movie, also a pretty good novel, uh, to to balance it. But yeah, well, I don't know. It just I should have loved this movie. Like everything about it seems like a Stephen would love this movie. It's a film about art. It's about a small, quiet thing. It has a lot of intimate moments, and it, I don't know, it just didn't propel itself anywhere for me. It didn't really work. I, so I, I think maybe part of why it might not have worked is that a lot of these scenes where they're sitting together, they're not really talking about anything. <laughs> like, they're, mm -hmm. they are, it's, I, it, it could be a combination of them just not being used to the camera being present yet, or it could be um, just that um, they're they they're still tra strangers to each other and they don't necessarily. I mean, he's a thief who stole like one of her main feature uh, pieces, like things that she's painted, and she doesn't know like if she can say something that will upset him and then he will, you know, get scary or whatever, right? Like it could just be a timidness. That's, that's a literal fear they both have about not knowing whether they could be in trouble. <laughs> um, but it, it, something feels off in a lot of their communication together. And at times it's, it, 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 it is fine. But in other times it just feels like, why was this shot out of all the shots you got the one that you think, is the one that you want to show the audience right now. Cause what does this conversation yeah. even mean at this point in time? Um, so, yeah, I, I think I felt that too. And there's also something where this feels like a nitpick, but the, the shots aren't that beautiful or interesting. Like I really feel like they are only trying to capture the dialogue. Like it, in a lot of documentaries like this, if they were trying to be experiential and just showing me a day in the life, they would like fixate on little details in their apartment or they would do, they would do something that is like painting a picture of their life visually. And I feel like this is filmed much more like a, I don't know, like a, a TLC show or something that is just like, let's tell the story of these two people. Like they didn't do anything interesting with the, 
with the filmmaking itself. It has a really high concept, but I don't, it didn't pull me in, in a way where I could be like happy to just hear them talk about coffee and the weather or something, because I was looking at something so beautiful. It, yeah. it just didn't really have that. And, and the funny thing too, is in a narrative version, like this guy, the thief in this story could one day write a memoir about the journey that he's been on over the course of his life. Right. Cause he's been through so much and he does go on like a literal journey. Like he evolves like mentally and physically by the end of this film. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I think yeah, he's that... turning into her boyfriend, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I, I just, I, I, yeah, I, I think that there's, it, it feels a lot like the person was making the film was like, I want to do a documentary on this woman because she makes awesome art. And then over the course of it, accidentally found this really, really interesting other character and couldn't figure out how to sp split the time between both and then tried to make it about the relationship as opposed to about these two separate individuals. So, yeah. Yeah. And her art is amazing. Like, I, oh, I do yeah. love the scenes of her painting and the result. Like, that hyper real style is really, really cool. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Also, <laughs> it shows how little I know about art. I didn't realize you could just like, roll up an oil painting and it wouldn't like crack and stuff like that <laughs> yeah you can do other things on it too apparently and it'll just be fine <laughs> oh but <laughs> anyways uh, and, and another thing i learned um norwegian prison seems really fucking nice <laughs> oh that that was the, that was the best part like like if you if you go to norwegian prison it's going to be 100% better than a studio apartment you'll find in the dog patch. <laughs> like, yeah. like it, it's the best micro studio you've ever had with an awesome view. And there's just like a whole forest inside the walls of the prison. <laughs> like I've been in 150 euro night hotels in Norway and that prison seemed better than, than the rooms <laughs> that I was paying for. Yeah, that was the other thing I learned too is apparently if you want to rent an art studio, it's five grand a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh but remember that that's not u.s dollar or maybe it is now i assume they're norwegian krona they're talking about which are like 10 cents so scale it down a lot <laughs> but then All that right. didn't really make sense either because the art that got stolen they said it was valued at twenty thousand. yeah which yeah, seems yeah. like not enough not enough money if those are in krona so, that, so that's what, so that's what i was thinking as well is that i wonder if because i believe at the time we hear that number it's a news report, which might not have been reporting this specific piece of art was going for this much money, but just like art from a gallery can range 20,000 or whatever. Like, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't know whether yeah. to trust that as gospel or, or what, but yeah. Yeah. It could also be that, cause I think I remember the person saying the word like million or something. So maybe the, the subtitles are trying to be clever and are trying to like transpose it back into U S dollars. I don't know the, the the money just didn't make sense to me. Like her bills were either way too high or way too low. <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> I, I feel like th th there was no happy medium, but that's yeah, a, yeah. a minor nitpick of me not understanding Norway enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Norway is fucking expensive. Like you go out for lunch in Norway and it's like $35. Like, you got to sell a lot of paintings if that's if that's what you're going to do. Well, you got to sell a lot or steal a lot. One of the two. Yep. Um, is there anything specifically you want to talk that we would consider a spoiler? I mean, we could discuss the ending, but I feel like the the fact that it should work and it just doesn't work is kind of enough for me. I don't know if I have more to elaborate on that would require explaining it. I just, I think if, I think if your girlfriend painted that painting, <laughs> yeah. you would not oh, you be and Joanna, You and Joanna both had that take. <laughs> I was actually fine with that. I, I was completely, okay, we can do a little spoiler actually just to talk about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, um, we will we will have a small spoiler section, <laughs> um, but for right now, 
<laughs> Let's get to verdicts for this film. Stephen Miller, if you were going to give us it a must-see, record with a caveat, wait for rental, pass with a caveat, or a must-avoid, what would you give it? I'm settling on a wait for rental. Um, I think conceptually this movie is potentially a must see like it, it is a really good concept and there are moments when they execute on it very well but then in terms of sheer enjoyment it is like a pass for the caveat there were just long stretches that i was not vibing with this movie and i felt like it it was running out of steam and it wasn't conveying what it wanted to convey so it, it's a fine rental. I think it's an interesting story, and it is maybe more interesting to think about later than it is to sit through. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it is unfortunately not the gripping humanistic documentary for me that I was hoping for. It, it just didn't jerk the tears the way that I thought they deserved to be jerked. Yeah, um, it's a wait for rental for me as well. It's right smack dab in the middle. I think, as you said, there there is a lot of good here, but I think fundamentally for me... A documentary should answer one of two questions. One being, why did you make this documentary? And two being, why did you finish the documentary you ended up making instead of what you intended to make? <laughs> and this mm -hmm. doesn't deliver on either of those two questions. Um, it's, it's really just interesting stuff that happens along a journey that doesn't pay off anything related to the journey that you're going on. Um, so it, it's... I think it, I think there's a there's a bunch of missteps in the storytelling, um, and but but like the moments that work really really do work, and they're the artwork and the authentic experience of the thief consuming that artwork is mm -hmm. is compelling and does have movement that should elevate this film, but I think the lack of cohesive narrative is what throws it off. So. Wait for rental for me as well. All right. So for the people who aren't going to stick around for spoilers, um, this is the end of the podcast for you. So Stephen Miller, if people want to find you throughout the week, where can they do that? Uh, people can find me rolled up and tied with string at sdavidmiller.com <laughs> or <laughs> twitter.com slash sdavidmiller. <laughs> people can find me painting a painting of Stephen tied up with string <laughs> sitting in the corner. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and the, st the string is Christopher Schlesi. <laughs> <laughs> but people can find me over at ChristopherRealLife.com or Twitter.com slash ChristopherIRL. You can find the podcast over at the where you can get a bunch of the back episodes of the show. If you want to subscribe to the show, you can do so on Overcast, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or wherever podcasts are found. If you want to know when the episodes go live, you can follow us at Twitter.com slash SpoilerWarning, Facebook.com slash TheSpoilerWarning, or Instagram.com slash TheSpoilerWarning. If you want to get a hold of us directly, you can send an email to fans at thespoilerwarning.com or you can use the contact form on our site. Music for this episode will come from the song that's playing during the trailer to this or during the credits to this film. So hopefully you were enjoying that. And uh, yeah, um, if you haven't seen the film, you can decide whether or not you want to stick around for spoilers. But we are going to let the music fade up. And when that music fades away, we are going to have a brief spoiler segment where we talk a little bit about... Uh, I guess the relationships in this film. <laughs> So we are back. This is spoiler territory. It's the after part of our review of The Painter and the Thief. And we are talking full-blown spoilers for this film. Um, so, I mean, I guess there's a few things we could talk about. Um, uh, if we want to digress right before we get to um, the the painting talk. Um, I did mention during the actual part of the review that the thief goes on like an honest-to-God literal journey in this story. And he... He almost dies and doesn't just like, I, I I don't know whether there's exaggeration that's happening when he's in the hospital, but the idea is that he might never walk again and goes from that to like hulking out. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy how quickly that happens. <laughs> yeah, he goes from train spotting to like Game of Thrones <laughs> in like no time. That is That was definitely surprising. And, and the time didn't. 
I felt like a lot of time had passed in documentary time, like they describe it as a long period of time. But then he's walking and he says, just think six weeks ago, I was in a coma almost like six weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this made it look like it was like a long time, not just a few weeks. I don't yeah. know. It, time time dilated in a kind of strange way for me in the documentary. But yeah, I mean, I assume that so he all we know is that he stole his girlfriend's car and then was potentially being pursued by the cops and tried to get away and wrecked his car. And that's how he received all the injuries. So, you know, how those freak things, they say that, like, if you're intoxicated or under the influence, your body doesn't like tense up the way it normally would in an accident. And you can just miraculously be fine in really gnarly uh, crashes. But I, I don't know. It, it did seem it, it did seem quite soon for him to be just up and about. But yeah. it, I, that's an interesting part of the story is just the fact that like he literally almost kills himself accidentally or recklessly and then has to recover so that he can go to prison. <laughs> like, yeah, uh, it, it's like, I don't know. It just th there, there was interesting stuff there where they're like, hey, you can't just take him yet. Like he can't even walk yet. Like let him recover. Then you can have him. Um, and then we'll call it a day. I don't know. That, 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 that kind of stuff in interested me a little bit. Yeah. Well, and am I getting the chronology wrong or after he recovers, does he go and meet up with Barbara and have a beer, which I feel like is a, a bold move for a heroin addict who is like just recovering is to meet up for alcohol right that 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 seemed kind of surprising to me yeah but maybe culturally they just don't have the same 12 steppy type ideas that we do <laughs> he i mean he definitely yeah because there, there's a there's a scene where he he definitely backwashes in <laughs> because mm -hmm. he can't like physically lift the glass up to his mouth quite quite properly um, <laughs> yeah but yeah anyways yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to mention that because that was that was a crazy transition and he goes from being this like junkie stealing painting to like a person who's been rehabilitated has a steady job finds a relationship um seems to be like progressing there um has aspirations yeah. to like start a family with this girl and I, I i think there's there's an interesting transformation that like is a real like he has fixed his life at that point and this documentary yeah. is less uh, it's less concerned with like showing that transformation um, and more just like, I mean, cut to today, look at him now. Let's go have this conversation about the painting that we uh, forgot that we knew about this whole time. Right. And what's interesting is that transformation is striking and it is definitely there. Like it isn't an accident that we notice that, <laughs> that, that we feel it, but it does feel like instead it is trying to tie in this, he keeps trying to call Barbara and she won't pick up the phone, which I feel like in the real world, the closest thing we get to an explanation is she d decides not to talk to him much anymore. Like it, it isn't that relationship piece. Isn't that satisfying? You know, yeah. it's, I, I, I feel like, again, they're just fixating on the wrong thing and it doesn't, I might be wrong, but I feel like there aren't many moments after the beginning of this movie where the filmmaker is talking directly to Carl Bertel and asking him how he feels because he doesn't really describe his thoughts. He tells his story like to a therapist he, yeah. and he does this kind of narration, this voiceover that seems like they prompted him to describe his situation. But I, I feel like they could have mined those recovery moments for something real and earnest and kind of poked a little bit and tried to get inside there. And yeah. they didn't because the narrative they want to tell is not about that. The narrative is about the relationship with these two people, these kind of two sides of the same coin who are going to, you know, enter each other's lives and then exit and then hopefully enter again. Yeah. Um, which leads me to the end when they meet again for the last time. And so Barbara has gone on this separate journey for all I know, it happened a while ago, right? And they're just in the chronology of the documentary making it seem like it had just happened. Yeah. Um, but she finds her painting just sitting down there, which I have so many questions. Like, if that's storage, why are random people just allowed to go in there? <laughs> um, yeah, that was... Or is that just like a, 
a universal storage that just everyone in Norway trusts everyone else to not open <laughs> open a door. Maybe, yeah, I mean, it seemed like they definitely got the super, and I'm sure they might have explained like, hey, here's the deal. I had this painting. You can look at the news story. You can look at my website. Yeah. I make these paintings. I have a tip that it might have been put in this building. Well, that's the other part of that story that was so annoying is the implication is that this other man stole it and gave it to a mob boss and the mob boss mm-hmm. lives in that building. If the painting was really given to the mob, like she's going to the mob boss's house and then it's not like she's like having the super let her into that guy's unit, right? It's just downstairs mm-hmm. in the storage. I feel like that they're building it up to be like something where some, you know, freaking Tony Soprano has her... <laughs> As her painting yeah. and he's gonna have to like fight her for it or something i don't know it's it's a weird setup that doesn't seem to be necessary yeah and i mean i think if you watched the goldfinch then you would have on your brain that art is often used as collateral in deals like it's like hey this is worth twenty thousand, so you hold on to this and that means i'm good for the money and i can you know i can make this deal and you can trust me to not run away yeah um so I kind of understand why it would just be sitting there. It's like one of the many things the guy has that is potentially valuable that he can't really sell at the moment. But yeah, there, there's a kind of anti-climax to it. Um, but anyway, so I do believe in that moment when she shows Bertil the painting, I can see why he would be moved in the sense that to him the act of stealing was kind of a symbol of where he was at that moment in his life. And I think there has to be a part of him that sees her as one of the many people that he has wronged and seeing the painting resurface is kind of like a weight being lifted. It's a symbol of that wrong being undone. I don't think their relationship really bears that out because they seem to have had forgiveness, you know, years at this point already so the that moment of the weight being lifted doesn't mean as much as i think it could but i do believe for him as this guy who thinks in very kind of grand moral and philosophic terms that this would be a a powerful moment and i did like the touch of him painstakingly nailing it back onto a frame i'm sure it isn't the same frame that he took it off of that day when it got stolen (laughs) but i did think that was a nice touch like the newscaster said that a hundred nails were removed. It would take an expert an hour. And then we learned he's a carpenter. Right? Yeah. So like it, you kind of piece all these things together. And it was nice seeing him flip it in the end. But yeah, the painting that she paints <laughs> at the end. Yeah. Um, if you want to talk about that. <laughs> yeah. So earlier on in the film, um, uh, when I'm already circling ideas in my head about like, okay, this is clearly a story of a woman and a man falling for each other from different worlds and then I'm like, oh, shit, she has this boyfriend who's around the whole time and seemingly doesn't care. That seems super strange. So I was I was pleasantly su- surprised when the thief brings his girlfriend to one of the painting sessions. And I was like, okay, cool. So they each have their respective somebody's everything's fine. This is copacetic, whatever. And um, she begins working on this this painting of him sprawled out on this sort of little like love seat thing with his girlfriend kind of sprawled out on top of him, embracing him. And she begins, like, sketching and working on this painting. And at the very, very end of the film, um, that is the the main highlight of the art gallery, uh, the, the the exhibit that she's she's throwing. This is sort of the centerpiece of that exhibit, this huge painting of that uh, photo. However, there was one alteration... And that is she has transplanted herself in place of the girlfriend embracing him in this photo in which was. And if you look at if you if you go to her website and look at her, her, her paintings like there, there, there is sexual energy to some of these paintings, right? Like they're they're not it's not just like very tame, whatever scenery of doves in a field. Um, This is this is clearly. Like, it's not that it's overly sexualized, but it's clearly romantically involved, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, well, I guess that, that's where I did not read that painting as being romantic. I read it as being, they are two symbols or stand-ins for, like, I feel like at this point, he is a motif, and the fact that 
she has started a friendship with him is probably a known thing about her as an artist. Like, I imagine the documentary isn't showing a bunch of interviews and other things that they've done talking about how he inspired her. So for me, when I see that painting, it it didn't strike me as very intimate or romantic. It just struck me as a meant to be a kind of jarring symbol of, look, the thief and the painter are together and I need him and he needs me. And I, I know their poses just didn't seem that romantic to me, but... I, mean, I she, may well she, be in the minority here. She's she's resting her cheek on his bare chest. <laughs> and she's like Wait, you and your bros don't do that? <laughs> only only you, Steven. <laughs> okay. Um but but I, I think that they're so in the in the Americanized romantic comedy version of this story, the entire film, the boyfriend thinks that she's romantically involved with this muse of hers. And then at the end, she reveals this painting, and that's when the shoe hits the floor or whatever, right? Or the shit hits the fan or whatever yeah. all the expressions are, where it's like, you can't fucking tell me this doesn't mean you're in love with them, right? Like, there, there is, I feel like I mean, maybe in Norway, everybody just lays their bare cheek on bare chests all the time. Um, but, I, sure. <laughs> but, but I think that, Gotta like, stay warm. It, it's, it's a, to me, there's a lot of significance to that choice, and... Um, I mean, to be fair, I, um, I believe that art for art's sake is totally fine. I don't think you need to have meaning behind beauty that you create. So, so you can say that, but like the audacity to reveal this in a gallery with the person who's in the painting with you and not be aware of how anybody would see and interpret that painting, it's just very very strange and i i feel like if you're in a relationship with person with a person and they paint themselves embracing another person in a six foot by ten foot canvas <laughs> and then show it to the world that's like <laughs> that's that's a uh, um i don't know the word for it but uh i cannot abide <laughs> yeah i i i completely understand that um, it's just to me, her posture at this point is very, I, I think she sees it more as he represents some darker instinct and she has that within herself. And so they're somehow tangled together. And I think she sees her, the same thing that kind of alienates me in this documentary is that I think she sees their friendship as a beautiful act on her part. And I think that is why it doesn't always feel sincere to me, is I feel like she is so aware of the the beautiful idea. It feels a little pompous. And I, I took that painting the same way, where she sees it as, look, we've come together. I am here. I'm granting him forgiveness, and he is granting me something. And I, don't know, I believe that she would make that in a way that is not romantic or intimate and also is oblivious to the notion that anyone would take it that way because she is a artist with a capital a right and that yeah that, that's kind of just how i read it is of course she would make that that, that doesn't <laughs> shock me at all <laughs> so so you you weren't disturbed by it because you were like fucking artist right <laughs> yeah yeah of course <laughs> and, and, and you know part part of the problem is that i am uh I am destroyed by the world of cliche and all of the films that we have seen over the last like, you know, 10 plus years um, where like there are things that read as cliche, but true, right? Like it's always cliche because it is the reality of things that go. And I, th and I think that, right. the, that this story is about a guy who doesn't care enough about himself to take care of himself like he's willing to die recklessly because he's incapable of thinking that he has value in this world and this woman with immense skill to create beauty paints him and quote sees him <laughs> right. um in a way that he's never felt before so i understand why he needs her she I know it. It's little Christopher feeling <laughs> confusing things about Titanic all over again. <laughs> so, anyways, the <laughs> I, I I think that 
for her, from her point of view, she is immensely talented, but she needs a subject that can draw it out of her, right? She is, as you said, capital A artist, somebody who, um, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't make the sculpture. She just releases it from the block of marble or whatever, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> the statue yep. was already there. She just freed it. Um, and, 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 and I think that for her, she finds this man who is incredibly curious, just, just who this person is. And at first, at, at first, the whole thing is like, why would you steal my shit? And then when, when she cannot get the answer from that, because at the time he was high or, you know, on something and doesn't even remember really doing the crime in the first place. When, when she realizes that she's not going to get anything from that, she becomes obsessed with who he is in other aspects of his life and just finds this incredible, incredibly interesting person who needs somebody to see him. And she is literally born with the gift to see things, right? <laughs> and yeah. and I, I think that there is a symmetry there. And there is beauty in that relationship of both people being what the other person needs. And those are the aspects that really made me draw into the story. But I think that in the end, he goes to prison for like eight years. Is it eight years? I feel like... Oh, I mean, I think... I think the eight years is how long he had been in prison before they met. Before they I, I don't met. think that's what happens at the end. Okay. Well, yeah. I don't know what happens after his other accident. Um, and so what, whatever it is, they clearly weren't talking while he was put away, right? Like she wasn't answering his calls. And I think that she yeah. sort of moved on with her life other than to finish that painting. I, I don't know. So I think, I think that, I think that when it comes back and they reveal that painting, who knows how long ago she made that or if she never finished that painting. And then once he got back in touch with her, she like spent a whole Saturday <laughs> finishing it. Or I, I don't know because the film isn't interested in telling us that story. But I think that like it's the filmmaker is trying to put extra symbolism on it because we've already seen scenes where they talk about her tattoo because he tells the interviewer like, Oh, I've never seen this before. She has a t tattoo that is like a series of circles inside each other. And I think that's just, that just is how she is. She's series of circles, whatever. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know. See, he... I saw it as a target, but I don't know. I don't know what it means necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. But they reveal the painting. And in case you didn't realize it's her, the camera goes boom and punches in on the circles on the back of her neck in the tattoo in the painting and then cuts back to being zoomed into her neck in real life and then back to the painting and then slowly draws out and everybody gets out of the frame and then we get the credits rolling over while you're watching that painting and i think that like yeah. making a very big deal of that reveal yeah yeah like 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 the filmmaker wants you to like look at that and think it's significant, you know, uh, you know, bringing it back to Titanic again, like that's, that painting is the, the heart of the sea or whatever the necklace is called. Right. <laughs> yeah. And the thing is, I, I think it would be a lot more significant if the best scene in the movie hadn't already happened where she has painted him before. Like if this was the first art that she made about them, that would be a really lovely bookend, right? Like yeah. we went on this journey and in the end I have a new magnum opus, you know, I have a new, thing that represents me and you are a part of it but it yeah it's just diluted by the fact that we've already seen her make multiple pieces about him in the past and yeah that, the way it is revealed feels a little too on the nose so i wasn't a huge fan of the reveal i just didn't i didn't have any problem with the painting as far as her being an artist i feel like her big bearded novelist husband boyfriend guy is gonna get over it he'll be fine <laughs> Cool. Uh, yeah. Is that is that a, is that an episode? I think that's an episode. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for listening. We will see you in our next review. Bye. Bye.